All right. Well, I know we'll still have a few people uh, joining us uh, throughout the first couple of minutes of this uh, presentation, but wanted to make sure we go ahead and get started relatively on time so we have as much time as possible with our presenters. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today for this lunchtime webinar. Uh, my name is Rowan Braybrook and I'm the Director of Programs for Northwest Natural Resource Group. NNRG is a Seattle-based nonprofit and we work with landowners on ecological forestry throughout the Pacific Northwest. Ecological forestry is an approach that mimics natural processes wherever possible and treats the forest as a whole system. So at NNRG, we work with landowners to both advance the state of knowledge about ecological forestry and also help landowners put it into practice around, uh, around the region. So today we have a very seasonally appropriate topic for you, snow for trees and watersheds. Uh, as you all know, we're in an era of climate change where we're seeing dry summer soils and a lot of competition among trees for soil moisture. So our question for this webinar is what forestry techniques might be able to help us address those challenges and what does it look like uh, when those challenges are either seen in the forest and when they're addressed? Uh, this project is supported, as you can see on the screen, by WCS's Adaptation Fund with additional support from our friends at Springboard Forestry. And we have two great presenters for you today um, to talk both about research and then the project implementation process. So our first presenter is going to be Susan Dickerson Lang, who is the principal hydrologist with Natural Systems Design. Uh, she is a hydrologist with experience that ranges from investigations of upland snow hydrology to urban stormwater quality, and she is particularly interested in understanding impacts to watersheds and evaluating strategies for restoration. Um, after Susan, we're going to have a second speaker, Jal Mann. Jal is an NRG's lead forester and oversees forestry projects across the South Sound region. Um, and he, in particular, recently has been overseeing our ongoing snow monitoring project near Ashford in collaboration with the Nisqually Community Forest. So he is here to share the process of what that looked like and initial findings. So we are going to hear from both presenters first, and then we're going to have some time for Q&A. So feel free to add questions in the chat so we can address them at the end. And without further ado, I can go ahead, stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Susan for her comments. Susan, over to you. And you are still muted, FYI. Fantastic, <clears throat> thank you. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, I'm really excited about this opportunity. Uh, so forest management and the effect on uh, snow storage has been a topic I've been interested in quite some time, ever since I started thinking about climate change effects on watershed, is an area that I then focused my dissertation work on at the University of Washington. And since then, since joining Natural Systems Design, have been collaborating with uh, the folks at the University of Washington, Seattle Public Utilities, and the Nature Conservancy to continue some of this work. So my role today is to provide some broad scale context for this work. Um, and then we can dive into the specifics of the NNRG study, which I'm also really excited to hear more about. Um, I do also wanna just give a shout out that what I'm giving you today is a synopsis of work that's been done over the course of several years by many, many, many people, um, and that all research is truly a collaboration, and I'm thankful for lots of great collaborative relationships that have contributed to this. And then just wanted to set the context um, that I think this group is probably well aware of climate change projections on stream flow. And uh, this is just one example in the Western Cascades in the South Fork Nooksack up near Bellingham. And the black is the uh, average stream flow under historic conditions. Two peak hydrograph where we see high flows in the, winter, the fall and winter. Uh, the hydrograph goes from October to September. So we see that first peak in October, November, December, followed by a second spring freshet as snow melts. 
And what we see into the future is that as the climate warms, we have less water stored as snow during the winter, and that hydrograph collapses, leading to higher flows in the summer or in the winter, followed by even lower flows in the summer because we don't have that snow melt component. And so in really thinking through this, the question of whether it's possible to manage forests in a way to maximize snow retention becomes even more important because effectively what we're seeing with climate change is a loss of snow storage from the watershed. And so there's quite a lot of interest both in the research world as well as the NAPLY world as to how much more snow could we store and what does that mean in terms of temperature and water quantity in the summer for the benefit of salmon, for the benefit of aquatic habitat, for the benefit of out of stream water uses. Um, and there's a number of active efforts uh, in our state. Uh, you might hear it called ridge top to river restoration. There's an effort called snow to flow. We've seen this question come up in stream flow restoration act grants in Washington state, as well as community forest plans, um, which some of the work today will play into. Um, and I do want to point out, this is not at all a new question. Um, I love this article from 1906 from the Ore Herald in Colorado, asking the question, does timber preserve snow? And pointing out that all forestry experts say it does. Um, and this work led to uh, all sorts of large scale experiments in the 30s and 40s and 50s, looking at the capability of forestry to affect the amount of water available. Now. Interestingly, most of the original work in this field was done in the continental US, so and, and in the continental part of Canada. Think colder and drier climate. And so it turns out that this is not wrong, but it is wrong for Western Washington. Um, and so that's a preview of some of the overall results, which we'll get into the specifics today. Um, so the question then becomes overall, what is the forest effect on snow storage, and both in terms of the amount and the duration of snow storage. Um, the Ori Herald says it's overall that timber preserves snow, and I'm going to tell you right now in Western Washington, that's not the case. Um, and so there's several processes that affect how snow is stored in the landscape. The first is that the forest intercepts snow in its branches, and once it's stored in the canopy, it's much more likely to melt or sublimate. So we see less snow accumulating in forests. The forest also affects the rate of melt of that snow through both sheltering from wind as well as shading from sunlight. And those are the, the processes, and they have effects at both a local scale and a forest stand scale. At a local scale, we see effects like tree wells in the upper photo, uh, you know, where we have less accumulation around the trunk and we actually have melting of snow driven by heat from that trunk from thermal radiation. And that those local effects build up to become stand scale effects that affect how much snow is stored at a stand scale and how long it lasts um, into the winter, which then has implications for the availability of water. Now the challenge becomes, as we think about this, I can show you this photo that shows you that snow is lasting longer in gaps in this photo where the duration is longer in open areas, but I can just as easily show you a photo where snow is lasting longer in the forest where it's already disappeared from large opening and openings and gaps. So this is where we get into a, a key question because forests can actually either delay or accelerate snow melt relative to open areas. Many of the original studies were done in a much colder climate where forests tend to delay snow melt, much like that bottom right photo. Whereas in Western Washington, we're in more of a regime where forests actually tend to accelerate snow melt, where snow lasts longer in gaps. And it turns out that this is a fairly large spread that um, I helped with a synthesis of studies of this around the entire globe. And what we found is that we pulled together all the studies that have been done comparing the amount and duration of snow storage in a forested area compared to an opening like a gap is that it ranges from snow lasting five weeks longer in the forest to snow lasting up to more than seven weeks longer in openings. So when we're talking about a span here of around 12 or 13 weeks difference. And so 
this becomes a critical question to forest management to understand whether opening up gaps or thinning is going to have a net effect to accelerate or delay the onset of snow melts and therefore that effect on snow retention. Um, here's just an example of that variation. These are, this is an observational study I helped with uh, looking at several different sites across the Pacific Northwest. In the top plot, we're looking at snow depth at Hog Pass in Oregon. And the blue is snow depth in an open gap area, whereas um, the green is snow depth in the forest. And what you'll see is that they track each other pretty well. Uh, through the season and then that snow actually melts faster in the open area, leading to earlier snow disappearance in the snow open, open area, whereas snow is retained longer in the forest um, as compared to the open area. Now the opposite is true at Snoqualmie Pass in Washington from some data we collected in 2015, where we see both much more snow accumulating in the gap, and that's again to that canopy interception effect that I mentioned, um, and snow lasting much longer in the gap compared to the open area. Um, so it turns out that there's not a ton of studies. So we don't have a, a huge rich data set to pull from, but we do have some data to pull from across the Western US. And that's where the work that NNRG did really helps to start to build up that data set. Um, but we can start to make some hypotheses around how the net effect of forest on snow retention varies across the Pacific Northwest and across the Western US. Um, and so I just wanna draw your attention to some of these colors to understand how the spatial variation works here. So if we look at the blue area, which covers much of the Western Cascades in Washington and Oregon, um, and then that's uh, the blue area correlates to the blue line on the graph, where the black line, which is kind of hidden up with this pink line, is showing a snow depth in the open as compared to what we think the snow depth will be uh, in the forest, which is that blue line. So just like the data I just showed you for Snoqualmie Pass, we're anticipating that there will be more snow in the open and that it will last longer relative to snow in the forests. So that's the black line in the open versus the blue line which is the forest in the Western Cascades. Now that contrasts with these yellow and green areas that are Eastern Washington and getting into the colder parts of Idaho and Montana, where again, the black line is representing snow in an open area like a gap, whereas the green line is representing snow in the forest in those climate conditions. And what we see in those conditions are that there's not as much difference in overall snow storage between the forest and the open, and that snow is actually ends up lasting longer in the forest as compared to the open. They cross over each other. So even there's less, though there's less snow in the forest to begin with due to canopy snow interception and the, the sublimation and melting that happens there, the snow just melts so much slower in the forest in those conditions that it ends up being retained later into the season, which has implications for water availability later in the season. So we can kind of map these hypotheses. I will point out that they are hypotheses. The only place that we actually have observations are the little numbers on this map. So there's a lot of room for additional work here, uh, which is where a study like this comes into play. Um, and just to give you an overview of what we found at other Western Cascades sites is we see that the gap plot uh, on the upper left as compared to a thin plot and a control second growth plot on the same day in April, we see a lot more snow in the gap as compared to either the thinned or the control. And just to give you a sense of the type of forest that we are talking about as we're comparing these in this study, the uh, circular photos are upward facing hemispherical photographs to give an idea of canopy opening. And then there's also a LIDAR canopy surface map on the right hand side to show you where those, how those gaps fit. So you can kind of see the circular gaps in the gap plots as compared to the little patchy smaller gaps in the thin plot. So very clearly snow lasting longer uh, in that gap plot, gap plot as compared to the thin plots and quite a lot more. 
Um, and we can also look at this in terms of a time series of data. Now, the thing I want to point out that's really relevant to the NNRG study and some of the things that um, these folks are looking at is that in the previous work that's been done, we found a large difference between like a gap, like an opening, which is the blue line in this snow depth plot, whereas we didn't find much difference between the thinned plot and the control plot. So you'll see that the purple and the yellow, or the purple and the sort of yellowish orange track each other through time, that they're almost exactly the same. Um, that one hypothesis that's working here is that the thin plot wasn't thinned enough to have an effect. And one of the remaining questions, particularly in Western Washington, is you know, how much thinning is enough thinning to have an effect on snow retention? Um, and just to get at that in a slightly different way, one, we don't have a lot more data in different types of thinned plots and different gradations, which is where, again, NNRG's work is going to come in um, and provide some nice filling of that data gap. We can guess that there's a threshold in this kind of threshold plot from our statistical model, somewhere around 60 to 80% canopy cover, but we don't know exactly where that is. Um, and so as we're thinking about the difference between open and forest, and where we're starting to be able to quantify that on Western Washington robustly, but the gradation in between still has some questions around it. And just to conclude, I want to, to point out that the Eastern Cascades has been a spatial and climatic data gap in these types of studies for some time. Um, and that one of, we just completed a three-year study to try to help fill that data gap, particularly given that the Eastern Cascades is um, an area where there's a lot of thinning and fire fuels reduction that's happening. Um, and so what we did here is that we chose a bunch of sites in the Eastern Cascades and these plots are simply showing the climatic and forest variation across the gradients of this map up here. Both the temperature gets colder as we go to the east and canopy cover, which is the CC here, goes from fairly dense to thinner. And as we start looking at snow in the forest versus gaps, we see a lot less difference in the Eastern Cascades than we do in the Western Cascades. Um, whereas in the Western Cascades, we see a lot more snow in gaps, with that snow lasting quite a bit longer. In the Eastern Cascades, there's some difference between forests and gaps, but typically we see the duration being close to synchronous. Um, and with that, I will say thank you. And also I do wanna give a big shout out to NNRG. Um, these bear photos eating my time-lapse camera is just one example of how difficult field studies of snow are. And so um, I, my hat's off to NNRG. I'm also really excited to hear what they uh, present today. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Susan. Very interesting and wonderful to get that overall context for the region. Um, and without further ado, I'm happy to pass it over to my colleague, Jal, to get into some of that regionally specific information and some of the initial findings from an ongoing research study that we have up near Ashford. Over to you, Jal. All right, let me just get my screen sharing working here. Just a second, you know, it's the old uh, minimize one window, find the right window. Okay, there we are. Are we all seeing that now? Yes, looks excellent. Okay. Well, hi everyone, I'm Joel Mann. I'm lead forester with NNRG, as Rowan mentioned. Um, thank you, Susan, for that presentation. That was really interesting. And uh, I've got all sorts of notes jotted down here of things that I wanna make sure we, we capture in our second year of monitoring now this winter after that. So I wanted to talk to you a bit about uh, this project we did at Nisqually Community Forest, which is on the west side of Mount Rainier. And a little background, um, which we can go through quickly because people are pretty familiar with it now at, at this point, but um, we're expecting to see drier, drier summers with longer summer drought and less um, snow lasting into the future. And we, we're doing a lot of forest practices in these areas to thin the forest because they're really dense um, second or third growth forests, which have been industrially managed in the past. And we are able to build climate resilience through some of the same forestry techniques that we're already doing in the landscape, 
um, such as thinning, and we can um, amplify the benefits for the forest of those uh, forestry techniques by, for example, thinning to lower densities and um, increasing plant diversity through both planting um, other species on the site and retaining species that are underrepresented when you're thinning. So in this project, we partnered with Nisqually Community Forest to implement some of these techniques and uh, get some local um, site-specific monitoring data. So these three techniques we used in this project are to thin the forest, which is going to give each tree a little bit more water, more access to light, less competition, and a better chance of survival, especially in drought conditions. We installed snow gaps um, to just hold more snow, as Susan was describing, since we're in Western Washington, and hold it longer into the snowmelt season. And then in those gaps, we've replanted them with seedlings from warmer seed zones, which are either lower elevation or farther south, in order to um, primarily to monitor those seedlings' survival and hopefully to have seedlings that, you know, in 50 years, once the climate conditions in the area have changed significantly, um, that they might be more suited for the site. So if you look at these pictures here, you see the top picture is showing some of the snow, snow accumulation gaps that were cut. And um, we're looking out to the west here towards um, Puget Sound. And this other picture on the bottom is from the other direction facing towards Rainier. So we're on the west slope of Rainier. And you can see it's all pretty homogenous um, second growth forest in that area and continuous canopy cover. So we, in this project, we're thinning 240 acres of young and mid-aged forest to a 15 to 40% lower density than a standard thinning. So normally when we'd thin in a stand like this, we might take out approximately half of the trees, which would be something like 25 to 30% of the volume because we're thinning from below, taking the smaller trees. Um, in this case, we're taking you know, very different, various different um, uh, amounts of tree removal but ranging between a little over 50% up to around 70% removal. And in addition, we're creating 20 snow gaps between a half acre and one acre each to promote snow accumulation and release it more slowly as meltwater in the spring. So we measured the snow depth here in, through two different techniques. Um, one was through transects, which we established, and we essentially walked those transects and measured using uh, avalanche probes, the snow depth every meter. And you can see in this photo that on the top of the photo, we um, there's going through the heavily thinned site. So it's about 70% removal. And I'll see, show you in a picture in a, a couple slides of what that looked like on the ground. And then through the snow gap and then into an unthinned stand on the other side. And the larger, the circles drawn on the map or on the photo there are where we had cameras located. And then we use those basically trail cameras, taking photos at two different times during the day, aiming at a measurement rod to be able to get measurement, snow depth measurements every day in those specific spots, even when we couldn't be there. So as you see here, we collected data every week during the winter and or every other week during the winter when it was accumulating and every week when the snow was melting in the springtime. Here's another shot of that same site. You can see on the top of the photo is the thin stand. On the um, left side of the photo is unthinned stand and snow gap on the bottom right. Um, kind of ties into what Susan was saying about the thinning density as a big effect. And this was the heaviest thinning. We removed about 70% of the stems from that forest on the top part of the picture. And you can see the forest floor through the canopy pretty clearly. Um, to me, that looks you know, a lot more like a forest you might see on the east side where Susan, I think you were saying that you were seeing more snow accumulating in the thin stands over there or in the forest versus on the west side. And um, if, you're, if you were doing a lighter thinning where the canopy was not fully, was not open at all, then I can imagine that you'd get very different results. Here's another shot with the thin stand on the top of the photo and the control unthin stand on the bottom. So you can see that we removed 70% of the stems, but there's still, there's still a lot of trees there. It's, you know, it's definitely still a forest, though from the top, if I go back real quick, you can really see through the, through the canopy. So it's kind of a very different perspective from the air and from the ground, which of course the snowflakes are seeing it from the air. <laughs> there's a few more pictures of the process here. On the left side, we've got one of the, the stadia rods, which are you know, homemade, um, essentially two by fours with the measurements painted on them. 
and we drove those into the ground and aimed the cameras at them, the camera installation going on there in the middle photo. And then on the right-hand side, we're up there on, we went up on skis or snowshoes to do the measurements along the transects. And that's with an avalanche probe, which we just measured every meter and um, had two people. So one could be measuring and the other recording. And also for safety, because we're you know, way up there in the mountains in the middle of winter with no cell service. So here's some of the early accumulation portion of the, of the season data, which is from three of the cameras. Um, you can see the on the left-hand side, we've got a camera and a gap. So you can see that's what the gap looked like in the middle of the winter. And that's the, the photo. These are actual photos from the cameras we were using to get the snow depth. And then there's, that data is graphed out here below. And um, you can see that they you know, accumulated quite a bit of snow in late December, early January. If you remember last winter, we got a lot of snow then and then really nothing the rest of January and February and most of March. So it was kind of an unusual season. But you can see we accumulated the most in the gap, middle, middle accumulation in the thinned, and less in the um, control unthinned stand. And the snow also kind of, it lost a bit in January, but then stabilized in the gap and really didn't melt very much, where the thinned and especially the unthinned stands just continued to melt pretty, pretty drastically all the way through into March, at least, before we got that last you know, spring snowfall. So this is also from the camera measurements, a little bit um, longer time scale going all the way into June when we saw the last snow disappearing. And so you see here in January, that big uptick of snow and then really pretty stable in the gap all the way through May when it finally started melting out with a little bit of an uptick in April when we had a pretty big snow event there. Where in the um, control stand, it melted pretty much all the way down to nothing at the beginning of March and had a little bit of an uptick in April, but it disappeared pretty much immediately, um, presumably because of what Susan was mentioning with the interception in the canopy and then that sublimating and melting out and dripping down onto the snow under the canopy and melting that really quickly. And we could really see that in action where if you're up there on a warm day, which there were a lot of warm days in January and February last winter, if you went into the control unthinned stand, it was, it was raining on you. You, know, you had to put on a raincoat and you went out into the gap and it was a sunny, beautiful, warm day. So it was just, there was a lot of, of um, dripping from the canopy happening there. And that seems like it melted out that snow that was in the um, thin, unthin stand really rapidly. So here's some of the data from the um, transects. And it followed kind of the same patterns as the cameras, but with a lot more measurement points because of course the cameras were aimed at specific spots that we you know, attempted to find areas that were representative of the stand for the camera, but um, it was not really randomized in the same way that doing the transect is. So these transects went from on the left side of the graph, zero meters to the right is um, about 200 meters. And they went through a thinned area, then through the gap and then through the control stand. So what you can see here is these are color coded by date. So the light blue is January and you can see there was quite a bit of snow in all of the areas. Um, similar snow accumulation in the thinned and the control stands, a bit more in the gap cut. And then you can see that even the next um, one we've got here, which has been purple in February, the thin stand still had a good bit of snow. It had lost some. The gap cut had lost none or actually accumulated some in areas. And the control stand had lost uh, more than half of its snow already. And the control stand really Never got it. Never got it back after that. Even um, in March, the thin stand had more snow than in April or than in February, but um, the control stand had less. And then by June, there was no snow left anywhere except the gap. And um, so we had a, about a month of increased um, snow duration in the gap versus the control. And the thin stand it was much more variable than the gap or the control. Um, but it also lasted a few weeks longer than the control did. And the reason for that extra variability in the thin stand is that um, in these thin treatments, you get a lot of variability in the canopy cover. There are some areas where the canopy might be essentially closed because there's a few trees nearby to each other and other areas where you're creating, you know, maybe a 20, 30 foot gap in the canopy and a lot more snow accumulated in those areas. So you can see this, the much more variability in the, in the thinned area snow measurements.
So as I mentioned, we planted seedlings in these gaps. We used uh, four different um, seed zones of Doug fir from mostly um, Southern Washington. And we used the seed lot selection tool to determine those um, sites that we wanted to source the Doug fir from. We also planted a Western white pine and uh, Western red cedar, which are not on the site very much and um, some Western hemlock too. We used browse protection for all of these seedlings, oh, most of the seedlings, um, because we didn't want to um, have elk browse end up being a um, complicating factor on seedling survival. We haven't really observed much browse, so because we're at high elevation, this might not have been strictly necessary, but it helped you know, eliminate that variable and also um, makes the trees much easier to find for future monitoring. So we had some challenges of this planting because we're at almost 4,000 feet and it's kind of tricky to plant trees at 4,000 feet because as you saw in the previous graph, the snow didn't melt until June in the gaps and this rain stopped falling about in June. So we did get some trees planted in June and we're still waiting to see what their survival really looks like next year. But um, we lost some, but we definitely have had some survival and some of the gaps were cut this year and we had the seedlings already and we wanted to try planting them in fall. Now, because it's hard to get seedlings in fall, just because of the way nursery schedules work, we ended up healing in these seedlings. Um, the capital, we worked with the Nisqually Land Trust to heal these in and um, they basically irrigated them and, and put them in these trenches over the summer and we brought them up and planted them this fall in um, right around the end of October. And that, of course, had some challenges, too, because the snow came pretty early this winter and we were you know, barely able to get them in before the area was snowbound. So we'll um, be excited to look at those seedlings next year and monitor their survival. But um, it's definitely a little bit tricky to plant up there. So we're still working on some analysis of the results, um, some further analysis, and we're planning to collect more data this winter. Um, some of the things we really want to focus in on this winter are looking at different sizes of snow gaps. We did um, just anecdotally notice that um, the main gap we were monitoring in last year was a one acre gap. And on the sunnier side of the gap, the snow definitely did melt more quickly than on the shadier side, though even on the sunniest area of the gap, um, which had quite a bit of direct sun most of the day, um, the snow still melted less quickly than in the control unthinned stand. Uh, we also want to or plan to measure snow accumulation and ablation in the different um, thinning treatments because we had three different thinning densities that we targeted. So we want to do some make data collection in those three different densities to see, um, as Susan mentioned, if we can narrow down more what the ideal thinning density would be to maintain uh, continuous or almost continuous canopy cover throughout the landscape, but also accumulate and store more snow into the spring. And finally, we're, uh, we've been sharing these results um, with anyone who's interested. And we, we presented at the National Adaptation Forum in Baltimore, well, Rowan, who's here, did. And we've been presenting to any other groups of interested folks, uh, such as yourselves, um, about these results. And we plan to keep doing that into the future. Thank you. I can um, hand this on back over to Rowan now. And I think we're ready to take some questions. Absolutely. And as I just mentioned, uh, you can drop your question into the chat or, or you could also raise your hand by clicking on reactions at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we do already have two questions in the chat. Looks like oriented toward Jal as you were presenting um, the project up at Nisqually. In the thinned stands, did you leave the log decks or were those removed? Um, we... That's an interesting question. We removed most of the, of the log decks, though there were some logs left in the um, thin stand and in the gap actually, just because of it's the nature of working up at those high elevations. Sometimes you kind of get caught off guard by the snow at the end of the season and the loggers just couldn't get some of those logs out um, by the end of that season. So they were left over winter and then later removed. So the plan is to remove nearly all of the logs in the thin stands though, um, you know, slash and treetops and any non-merchantable material is distributed back into the stands. Mm 
um, and thereby, I see, thereby further helping the soil. <laughs> yes, exactly. I see another question here about the size of the snow gaps. Um, we decided that essentially in um, consultation with you know folks like I think we talked with Susan about that, and also looking just at the literature and what people were what most people were trying in different areas, and kind of combined that with you know other sensitivities like aesthetic considerations. You know, it's a site that's used for recreation and they want to the landowner wants to maintain you know nearly continuous forest cover across the landscape and we were wanted to avoid getting into gaps that were too large because then we'd have more um, more snow coming in and other effects that are going to increase snow melt um, where if they're too small you might not see any effects there um, Susan do you want to add anything else about gap size um maybe just two thoughts uh, and maybe it relates to a, another question that I just saw pop up but you know, in terms of gap size, one of the key issues is just the solar geometry in terms of the height of the trees, the diameter of the gap, and you know, what time of year that snow is melting based on the temperatures and elevation. So this is a really high elevation site. And so um, even for a relatively small gap, we're gonna get some amount of direct sunlight on that gap just simply because it tends to be melting later in the year. Although actually this year I think was remarkably warm in the winter given your results. Um, the other question which is still kind of a key question is the wind attenuation across gaps. One question that often comes up when I'm talking about this is, you know, should we just clear cut for snow retention? And, you know, it's no, because we're thinking about kind of multi-benefit management, but also the, the fetch, so the distance over which wind can move has a strong effect on snow melt processes. And so it's not well understood kind of what that maximum opening size is in terms of wind driven snow ablation, but that's kind of a key consideration as well. And um, I would mention also these, the gaps we were monitoring are um, this last winter were pretty much all on, a, on, on flat ground on a ridge top. Um, we do have some gaps that we're going to be potentially monitoring this winter with some slightly more varied aspects, though they're pretty much all um, flat to southern aspects. We don't really have any on northern aspects. So that would affect gap size too. Right? You would want, you could make a larger gap without having as much sun impact on a northern aspect as on a southern aspect. Um, but really? we didn't specifically analyze that, at least at this point. I see a question about that. I don't know, if, Susan, if you have more to say about that. Maybe just one other thought on that is that the the work that's been done to date on that question would suggest that there's less of a difference on north versus south facing aspects in western the western Cascades simply because we have much cloudier conditions during the ablation season. And so whereas on the east side of the Cascades where we have really clear sky conditions in April, May, June, when we're seeing the bulk of our snow melt. And so that aspect matters a lot more in terms of driving snow melt and the Western Cascades seems to be a much more muted effect. Great, and uh, Michael had a question on the seed lot selection tool. Did you consider, when using it, did you consider changes in summer aridity or uh, what were some of the metrics used during uh, the using the seed slot selection tool? So I think that would be for Jal to answer. Yeah, I, would, I, I was not all that involved in, in that process. Um, I think I don't, I don't believe we did any tweaking beyond what the seed lot selection tool was was able to tell us based on our specific area and and elevation, um, which is going to build in some some assumptions about increasing summer aridity just based on the region and the more broad climate impacts expected in the area. Yeah, I will say more broadly when use when using the seed lot selection tool, which we also did extensively at our project at Stossel Creek. Um, one thing that we have definitely noticed is the fewer tweaks that you make, uh, the better, because when you're making too many tweaks to try to get it specifically for a very hyper-localized site, it can really throw some of the geographical measurements out of whack. So the fewer inputs, uh, the better when it comes to finding uh, seedlot lo locations for future climate projections.
I'm just scrolling through some of the questions here. You mentioned Western white pine. Have you had good successful survival? And do you know about any research in terms of species and canopy composition and site conditions like slope, site index aspect, and water impacts? Um, I would say that we, we've, we've, it's kind of a little too early to see, you know, what the Western white pine survival is going to look like on our site. Um, we expect it to do a little bit better on you know, droughtier sites. And um, there is some Western white pine already in the area. It's not particularly common up there. Um, so we'll kind of need to wait and see how exactly it does there, but I would definitely prioritize planting it on areas that are more rocky or more, um, more droughty, more exposed. As far as uh, um, other literature research about the Western white pine, um, so sort of species and site and the site conditions for survival. Um, I don't have any any good resources I could quote off the top of my head. I don't know if um, Rowan or Susan, you might have some insight there. Uh, related more generally, not for elevation, but for species selection, we do have kind of a sister project at Stossel Creek. Uh, it is, as I mentioned, lower elevation, but it is looking at differences in seedling survival. And I believe Western white pine is one of the species. So I'll put that in the chat as well, if folks are interested in that. Um, any plans to analyze effects of gap treatment or thinning on individual tree growth and overall stand production? And does more soil moisture associated with thinning or gaps increase the individual tree growth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we, we don't have particular plans right now to measure um, tree growth as part of this, though that's certainly something that could be done. Um, and we've done that in other, in other projects and other sites. And we definitely would expect the individual tree growth in the thinning to be increased. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the main reasons that are, they're doing the thinning there. And we would expect the individual tree growth to be most increased in the um, heavier thinnings where the overall stand growth um, probably would do best on the more medium thinning, which is more similar to kind of standard practice. And um, yes, as the, the question mentioned uh, in, in the gaps, yeah, I would expect the trees at the gap edges to, you know, some, we might lose some due to increased wind throw and, um, you know, they're not used to being in that sort of environment, but the ones that do survive, we would expect that they'll, um, they'll do pretty nicely on those gap edges. Maybe I'll just add to that, that that's a critical question from a hydrologic standpoint. Uh, you know, the research is giving us good confidence in the overall effect of forest management on the magnitude and duration of snow storage. Mm -hmm. And we can draw a pretty thick dotted line between that and soil moisture availability, both the amount and timing, um, as well as kind of the local scale effects of climate refugia and you know, cold air pools and that sort of thing. In terms of then drawing the dotted line from that to stream flow, you know, we're able to do that from a modeling perspective um, that some models have been developed to be able to represent the gap dynamic where we have increased snow accumulation and shading by that adjacent tree cover. But that question of how does the forest respond locally to the increased water availability, whether there's a dynamic response in terms of water use and root growth and how that water is redistributed versus how it makes it to the stream is a um, really important and open question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's something that we we hope to to maybe do in the future is to um, to look more at what the actual hydrology effects are because right now what we saw is that the snow was it was stayed longer in the gaps, but we'd love to have you know a paired watershed study where we have gaps in one watershed and not in another, and actually see if the if we're actually seeing increased stream flow in the spring in areas where we put in the gaps. Um, you know that's a a bit of a longer term study that we that would be a little more difficult to analyze, but. That's something we'd love to do in the future. Another question for Susan. You mentioned the effects of forest shading on snowmelt and gaps. Are you also considering uh, slope steepness, especially on north facing slopes? Um, so yes, in the sense, typically we think in terms of overall heat load 
And the heat load is going to be a function of both the aspect as well as the slope. So if you have a south facing slope that is steeper, you have a higher heat load than a south facing slope with a more gentle slope. So from that perspective, Yes, from a modeling perspective, again, there's not a whole lot of observational paired data that actually help. We can't look too closely at that gradation observationally, but we can make some assumptions from a modeling perspective. And there's been some nice modeling studies looking at gaps at different angles under different latitudes and different cloudy sky conditions, which I could you know, point Rowan and Jal to, to provide as well. Yeah, and we're happy to send uh, some links out afterwards for further resources. Um, so if there are any particular resources you're looking for, feel free to drop them in the chat and we can send out an email with both this recording and some additional resources for everyone. Uh, I see we've got a question um, about whether Nisqually Community Forest expressed any concern with increased opportunity for invasive species within the gaps and if it creates additional management challenges. Um, the, there isn't really a, much of a seed source there for invasive species because there aren't any in the, in the area. Um, we definitely make sure the loggers are bringing, coming in with clean equipment because that's the most likely source for invasive species. Um, so it does increase, there's a risk of that and it does create additional management challenges um, because when you've got, we're essentially creating little you know, tiny stands within the larger forest. So for example, if they wanted to do a timber cruise in that area in the future, it's going to be more difficult to get good statistics because you've got lots of little stands built into your larger stand. But that sort of natural, more natural heterogeneity is one of their targets and they want a forest that's more variable, more like a natural forest. So yes, it's definitely easier to manage it all as a even aged plantation, but that's not, not the target for the landowner there. And so they're, they're okay with creating that additional complexity. And we'll, we'll continue to monitor for invasive species so that we can make sure to remove any that do start to pop up before they get widespread. And Jal, is that mostly in the gaps where you're looking for invasive species uh, or have you noticed any issues in thinned areas as well? Um, in this area, we haven't noticed issues in either place, but in general, um, it, it, they, you can definitely get invasive species coming into thinned areas. It's more of an issue on gaps or sometimes the landing, which can end up being a gap because things like scotch broom or blackberry really thrive when they've got um, full sun, where they might get into the understory in a thinned area, but um, they don't usually become nearly as prominent. And for either of you, have there been any studies done related to wildlife and how they respond to the gaps? We've definitely- not, Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna say we, um, I'm not aware of all that much detail on that since it's not something I've looked into too much. I can say that we on the wildlife cameras um, saw a ton of elk using the gaps and picked up no wildlife anywhere else. So the elk were definitely happy to have the gaps in the springtime. And um, we would definitely expect to see different wildlife using the gaps than what's in the um, unthinned or the thin stands because this landscape you saw in the pictures looking out over the whole valley is, has pretty much all been continuous forest cover. So having some areas with some more varied habitat, some more um, you know, brushy species that grow up in these open sites is definitely going to increase the wildlife, um, wildlife variety. I was just going to say, I'm not as familiar with that body of literature, but my discussions with folks at the Forest Service and DNR have been around that there, there are other reasons, there are wildlife driven reasons to create gaps. And so we've talked about you know, stone retention as kind of a piece of the puzzle and sort of a multi-benefit uh, matrix. Um, and then the other, I just thought this was kind of interesting, Seattle Public Utilities is actively creating experimental gaps for the benefit of mar marbled murrelet habitat um, and kind of mm -hmm. leaving one big snag and then putting a gap around it or one big tree to try to accelerate the growth of that tree. Yes, I've actually seen a couple of those gaps on the uh, tour that SPU um, up at Cedar River did this year, which is really interesting. Uh, and I know in some of the areas where they've done gap cuts at Seattle Public Utilities, they've been seeding it in with native seeds for ungulate feeding. So mostly with elk, but some deer as well to provide additional seed sources because there really aren't any any more of those natural gaps or natural um, 
small fields in the mid-elevation forests that there used to be because a lot of them have been seeded in post with a more plantation monoculture. Um, so in some, in a lot of ways, creating some of these gaps can create more diversity, but then also uh, diversity within safety since a lot of species won't venture too far from the forest for protection reasons. So they'll maybe go out about 50 yards into uh, a gap to feed, but then they want to make sure they're still close enough to the forest edge that they can disappear if there are any threats. Um, so I know that that's a, a very interesting project that Seattle Public Utilities is continuing <clears throat> to work on. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, I need to take a drink, but Susan, there is another question for you on uh, recommending tools or rules of thumb that we could use in forest management planning for snow. Um, sure, so I guess um, I can send this out to Rowan um, or feel free to get in touch with me as well. Um, along with some collaborators, we published an open access paper last year that um, kind of puts together a framework for where we think opening the forest will tend to have the most effect on snow retention. Um, and that is a resource that has kind of an online map associated with it where you can kind of zoom in and take a look at what we're hypothesizing and has a nice synthesis of what's known and some thoughts around forest management. Um, so that would be one resource to look at. Um, in general, for the Western Cascades, opening gaps um, and heavy thinning uh, seem to be the best for snow retention. Um, and the, there's less concern about opening bigger gaps from a shading perspective because of the things we mentioned before, because we have such shady or cloudy sky conditions during the um, spring and summer months in early summer. Uh, so there's there's that component. Um, and then the other piece I would kind of mention is from a climate change perspective, thinking about forest management for snow retention, the higher the elevation, the better. That snow rain transition line is going to rise, it's going to continue to rise. And so, you know, it's really nice to see NNRG collect some data at 4,000 feet. Um, that's higher than any study I know of in the Western Cascade. So it's nice to um, see that those same conclusions are holding there. And our best opportunity from a long-term climate change resilience perspective is to put those snow gaps higher in the forest. Um, and I would say from the Eastern Cascade side, if there's any Eastern Cascades folks, um, there is evidence of overall more snow storage uh, in gaps and thin forests, but not there's not that duration signal. So we're not seeing a lot of extension of the snow melt, except possibly on north facing slopes. There's some preliminary evidence that that's the case that needs some more vetting. But that on the Eastern Cascades, that aspect comparison is probably going to matter a lot more than on the Western Cascades. Um, I see a question here we've got about um, whether this data could be used to make the case for more late state, late state, late serial structure on more acres. Um, I think it's, this really, I mean, this just applies for higher elevation areas where we're going to have significant snow accumulation. Like Susan said, that's continuing to, to go up. So, in, but in higher elevation areas, um, definitely late serial structure is going to be much closer to this heavy thinning treatment that we have, because you might have, you know, in an old growth forest, at least in lower elevations, you might have, you know, 25 to 50 trees per acre of the overstory trees, and then a lot of smaller trees underneath. So you've got a really discontinuous canopy and more opportunities for snow to fall through the canopy and um, reach the forest floor. So I think you, in a late serial structure forest, you would have more snow accumulation on the forest floor just based on what we're seeing in these thinning sites. I'm not aware of any research specifically looking at late serial structure at higher elevations for snow accumulation. Um, Susan, are you aware of anything like that? No. That would be a fascinating study. Well, we have just a few minutes left. So if you have any final questions, let us know. Um, Brandy, looks like you have your hand raised. Is that okay? I just thought yes, absolutely. it'd be easier than typing. <laughs> So I think, you know, my question really comes down to understanding how the how the findings are 
being proposed, how you're proposing to use the findings. And there's a few things that are running through my mind as I listen to your research, which is really compelling research. And as I said, you know, the South Fork of the Nooksack is a uh, glacier-fed system that is experiencing some really serious stream flow problems because of the glacier melt, right? So something like this might be helpful. As a rule, though, I, I get kind of concerned about looking at just trying to retain snow versus trying to have structure in the forest that is functioning in the way that we want it to be functioning. And that's really what my question is getting at is like, how are we intending this data to be used and applied? And and then I have one more, and it's really not like, there's nothing like, it's just a rhetorical question. Just, I think this community needs to be thinking about that. You know, what do we want to do with this? Is our goal just to retain snow longer? Or is our, do, our goal to have forests functioning on the West side, the way that they would function if they hadn't been cut as many times as they've been cut and overstocked the way that they're overstocked. And so then that leads me to this thing that I want to say, which is that having worked for the Forest Service and worked with Jan Henderson in the past and his recommendations that higher elevations, that there's very judicious use of cutting in the higher elevations, I would just encourage us to be thinking about structure and less about and structure for forest health and function rather than um, just trying to get more snow retained on the landscape for one or two weeks longer in the season. But that's me, and I'd love to hear any reactions to that, but that was really hard to put into a, a, a chat a chat uh, text, so thanks for letting me talk. I guess my reaction to that is um, it's fortunate that the um, you know, those late cerro stand conditions seem like they would they would accumulate and hold quite a bit more snow than the standard plantation forestry, which does maintain those really um, dense stands with really um, impermeable canopies. So I think there's a lot of overlap there where you can manage for late cerro conditions and mat more mature forests and also accumulate more snow through doing that. And you know, every landowner of course has different um, combinations of goals and you know, there's different restrictions on what they are able to do. But there's a lot of connections where um, you could really uh, benefit snow accumulation and also, you know, overall forest structure and health. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I mean, I, I guess I tend to speak in shorthand of gaps versus forest, but that's where we're kind of looking at this contrast between the net effect of an open area versus a forest on the magnitude and duration of snow storage. But really, a, you know, a forest is some mixture of forests and gaps and gaps of different sizes. And particularly as we get into late cereal structures that it's a much more uneven kind of uh, forest dynamic. And so, um, you know, I would say that we're not, I'm not suggesting that you go cut gaps everywhere, but rather that as we're thinking about sort of multi-benefit strategies like wild wildlife gaps, suppose we're thinking about forest restoration as we're thinking about fire fuels reduction, that this understanding of how that those actions affect snow can play into sort of a multi-benefit framework. Yeah, so in some ways the snow snow accumulation kind of acts as a proxy for other types of eco forest ecological health and at the risk of repeating what you've already said, you know, there's there's kind of a spectrum of forestry processes where you go from the overstocked forest, lightly thinned, heavily thinned, small gap cuts, large gap cuts, clear cuts. And we're kind of looking where along that spectrum can we hit that optimum balance between having forest health for multiple benefits, including animals and including hydrology, um, you know, while still having um, some of those natural hydrological processes that we would see in a more uh, old growth type stand. Um, so where exactly that balance falls is something that we're still looking at and looking at other uh, studies as well, as Susan mentioned, but um, slowly trying to come to consensus about where exactly that balance hits. Yeah, and with this and this Nisqually Community Forest landowner, you know, they don't want to put, you know, hundreds and hundreds of gaps all over the place is not their goal. Um, the gaps give you a neat opportunity to bring in some seed seedlings from different seed zones and different species and give more heterogeneity to the forest. But I think the result of finding the more snow accumulation in the heavy thinning area was really interesting and inspiring because that's a treatment that could be um, spread over a much larger landscape. You know, they might 
we might decide to increase the um, how aggressively we're thinning across the entire forest, for example, by let's say 10 or 15% more removal. And that could lead to more stove accumulation over the whole, you know, thousands of acres of forest. And so um, it's, it'll be really interesting to look at with this year at more specifically what the different densities of thinning do to the snow accumulation so that we can start to make some broader kind of management scale decisions and recommendations. Absolutely. Well, I know we're at the top of the hour. Um, are there any final thoughts you wanted to leave folks with? Uh, if not, we will be sending out a follow-up email with some additional resources. Just thanks for the opportunity and thanks for all the great questions. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Have a wonderful day and uh, have a wonderful holiday season with lots of snow. <laughs> <laughs> Hope so. Hope so. Bye.